Loyalty to the Sovereign and the Scottish Heralds In this, the year of the Queen's Diamond Jubilee, it is appropriate for me, as an officer of arms, to review the historical relationship between the Sovereign and the officers of arms throughout four particular periods of Scottish history. Every officer of arms in Scotland swears an oath on appointment which includes the phrase, I will be faithful and bear true allegiance to Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth and will defend her to the utmost of my power. From then on, each officer wears a sovereign's coat when on official duty subject in the realm who is allowed to do so along with the other fellow officers of arms. No other member of the royal household, including children of the sovereign, can wear the royal arms of the United Kingdom. This places the officers of arms in a unique position, particularly when national politics intervenes. He and she, there are female officers of arms in Scotland, they are loyal servants of the sovereign, but can be subject to changes in the national life of the realm. This has happened on four different occasions in the history of Scotland, and it is useful to consider the first three before culminating with events in the mid-18th century. The first crisis. When Mary Queen of Scots returned to her kingdom in August 1561, she found the country undergoing religious change, supported by a group of influential nobles, including her half-brother, James Stuart, later created Earl of Murray. Following the Queen's marriage to Henry Lord Darnley in 1565, the birth of her son in 1566, and the murder of her husband in 1567, civil broke out between the Queen and her supporters, and those who opposed her on religious and moral grounds. At Carberry Hill, East Lothian, on the 15th of June 1567, the Queen was defeated and abdicated soon afterwards. The Queen's Lord Lion King of Arms, Sir Robert Foreman of Luthery, whose heraldry one can see on the screen in the top bottom left corner, he and his brother Heralds were caught between loyalty to her and the forces against her. Lion Sir Robert Foreman resigned in December 1567. He was replaced by Sir William Stuart of Luthery on the 20th of February 1568, uh, whom his heraldry with the Stuart fest blue and white is seen on the screen. He had a short reign as lion because he was imprisoned, demitted of office and burned at the stake in August 1569 on trumped up charges of witchcraft and necromancy. The real reason for his death was not warning Regent Murray about an intended conspiracy against him. He was replaced as Lion by Sir David Lindsay of Rathillet in September 1568. Edinburgh Castle, which contained the Royal Mint and the Honours of Scotland, the Scottish Crown Jewels, was held on behalf of the Queen by Sir William Kirkcaldy of Grange from 1571 until 1573. And on the left of the screen you can see the coat of arms of uh, Kirkcaldy of Grange. In the castle with him, as loyal supporters of the Queen, were Adam McCulloch, Marchmont Herald, Peter Thompson, Eiley Herald, John Foreman, Rothsey Herald, the son of Lion Sir Robert Foreman, Alexander Forrester, Carrick Pursuivant, Alexander McCulloch, 
Ormond Pursuivant, a relative of Marchmont Herald, Thomas Barry Pursuivant, and William Barry, a messenger at arms. The remaining three heralds and three pursuivants who made up the heraldic executive in Scotland presumably kept a low profile and obeyed Parliament and the Earl of Murray, who became regent after the abdication of Mary on the 24th of July 1567. An interesting episode took place in 1571 when the Scottish Parliament wished to meet in Stirling during August. The honours of Scotland were required for the conduct of parliamentary business, but Kirkcaldy of Grange refused to allow them to leave the castle. Undaunted, the new regent, the Earl of Lennox, who replaced the assassinated regent Murray, ordered a duplicate crown, sword and scepter to be manufactured. These were used in Stirling and later at a meeting of Parliament in Edinburgh the following April. In May 1573, Kirkcaldy surrendered the castle after an intense bombardment and was hanged by order of the regent. Two years earlier, the six officers of arms and the messenger were all demitted from office on the 28th of August 1571 by an act of Parliament while still inside the castle. Adam McCulloch and John Foreman were later reinstated. The Second Crisis King Charles I was executed by order of the English Parliament 30th of January 1649. Here on the screen you can see Cromwell on the left, Oliver Cromwell, protector, Lord Protector of England, and on the right, the King. When the Scots heard of the king's death, his son was immediately proclaimed king by the Scottish heralds in Edinburgh. And as soon as the English Parliament heard a new proclaimed, it dispatched the new model army under Oliver Cromwell to Scotland, where, after winning the Battle of Dunbar on the 3rd of September 1650, an army of occupation. Before the army controlled the whole of Scotland, Prince Charles returned from Dutch exile and was crowned King of Scots at Schoon on the 1st of January 1561. The then Lion King of Arms was Sir James Balfour of Den Milne, who officiated at what would be the last Scottish coronation, along with his brother Harold. By 1652, a tender of union between England and Scotland was proclaimed at Edinburgh Market Cross. I have no information on which heralds were involved and Granny Cromwell acquired full control of Scotland. Here you can see on the screen a Dutch version of the coronation of Charles II at Schoon and on the King's right hand side one can see the Lord Lyon uh, with his baton of office. On the screen, the arms of uh, various lions following, but the first the shield with the trefoils, green trefoils, is that of Sir James Balfour of Den Mill. Cromwell's control of Scotland meant that the Scottish Parliament was not allowed to meet. Lion Sir James Balfour was forced from office in 1654 and was eventually replaced by Sir James Campbell of Lawyers, who was crowned as Lion by Oliver Cromwell himself in May 1658, a few months before the death of Cromwell. And there you can see the Campbell coat, the Guirany of eight, black and gold, which was used by Sir James Campbell. Cromwell died on the 3rd of September 1658 and his protectorate collapsed with him. It took time before King Charles II of Scotland was invited to ascend the throne of England and was proclaimed as such on the 14th of May 1660 in Edinburgh, London and Dublin. 
The Scottish Government, in the form of the Committee of Estates, met on the 23rd of August and began to reorganise national life in a royalist manner. A new Lord Lyon was appointed, Sir Alexander Durham of Largo, who was crowned Lyon five days later. And there you can see his arms on the screen with the red crescent on a gold field with three mullets at the top of the shield. Thereafter, a new Lord Lion deputy and a new Lion clerk were chosen, along with a new Unicorn Pursuivant on the 27th of December. The clear-out of heralds and pursuivants continued. A new Eiley herald, Carrick, Dingwall, Ormond, Butte and Contointed on the 5th of January 1661. A new Marchmont Herald on 1st of February and a new Snowden Herald on the 12th of July were also chosen in 1661. The Scottish Heraldic Executive only had three heralds left from before the Restoration. All others were new men loyal to King Charles. This indicates that nine of those who had been appointed under Charles I had forsworn their oath of loyalty and served Cromwell's regime. The Jacobite movement came into being after the deposition of King James VII and II in 1689. He fled to France and lived in the chateau of Saint-Germain-en-Laye. After his death in 1701, Supporters of the movement transferred their loyalty to his son, who became de jure King James VIII and III, and later to his son, Prince Charles Edward Stuart, who became, on 1st of January 1766, de jure King Charles III. In 1708, James VIII attempted to land at Leith under escort of a French fleet, but the Royal Navy intervened and he had to return to France. On the throne, of course, was Queen Anne from 1702 to 1714, the daughter of uh, James. And there you can see the coat of arms of Great Britain used by her. The third crisis. Following the death of Queen Anne in 1714, a descendant of King James VI of Scotland, first of England, George Louis, Elector of Hanover, was invited to become King of Great Britain. He was crowned in London on the 19th of October 1714, and Lord Lyons and Alexander Erskine of Cambo was present at the coronation. He had been appointed Lord Lyon back in 1672 and became joint Lyon with his son in 1707. There you can see his coat of arms on the left. He was a baronet of Nova Scotia and that is indicated by the little square in the top left-hand corner of the shield. The Earl of Mar was the catalyst for the 1715 Rising. And the Lord knew of his intention to raise the Jacobite standard at Braemar in September 1715. On the 7th of September, the Lord Lion was confined in Edinburgh Castle on the grounds of suspected Jacobite leanings, but was released soon after. Although he may have had sympathies regarded as being loyal enough to the new and remained as Lion until his death in 1727. None of Lyon's brother heralds were having Jacobite connections, and there was no changeover of officers as had happened after the, after the Restoration. However, 1715 must have been a time of uncertainty for many in official positions. The Battle of Sheriff Muir took place on the 13th of May, which had been won by the Earl of Mar, but he withdrew eroding Jacobite hopes of replacing George I. By then it was too late 
to stop James VIII from landing at Peterhead, whose coat of arms you see in the bottom right hand side of the screen. He immediately caught a cold and moved to Fetteresu near Stonehaven, principal seat of the Earl Marshal. He travelled on to Brechin Castle, Kinnaird Castle and Glam's Castle before setting up a Spartan court at Schoon near Perth. By January 1716 it was obvious the cause was lost and James left Scotland from Montrose on the 4th of February and returned to Italy, never to set foot in Scotland again. None of the heralds were involved in any of the proclamations for James. Four years later, a combined Highland Spanish attempt to further the cause of James VIII and III failed at the Battle of Glenshield on the 10th of June 1719. But on the 31st of December the following year, Prince Charles Edward Stuart was born in Rome. There were doubt about the Hanoverian loyalty of the new Lord Lion appointed on the 6th of July 1726. He was Alexander Brodie of Brodie and had never been an officer of arms before becoming a lion. There on the left you can see his arms both in black and white and colour and he on the right with a magnificent wig wearing his bag as lion. There was a full complement of six heralds and six servants when Brodie was appointed. But within a year, he appointed James Fordyce as Snowden Herald in 1728, and in the following year, a James Brodie as Marchmont Herald. It is not known if he was a relation, but it appears more knowing how the appointment system operated. After the 1745-46 rising, Brodie appointed a George Brodie as Carrick Pursuivant in 1747. Blood is thicker than water in Scotland. But presumably, Brodie wanted men whose loyalty in those uncertain times seemed unquestionable. The Fourth Crisis This is not the place to describe events leading to the entry of Prince Charles Edward Stuart and his Jacobite army to Edinburgh on 15th September 1745, but once established in the palace of Holyrood House, the prince instructed the royal proclamation should be made at the Market Cross of Edinburgh. On the screen you can see the Duke of Cumberland on the left, on the right Prince Charles Edward Stuart. On the 17th of September with due pomp and ceremony, Roderick Chalmers of Port Lethen, Ross Herald, seen here on the left, accompanied by Alexander Martin, Eiley Herald, James Fordyce, Snowden Herald, William Gray, Dingwall Percival, and James Clarkson, Kintyre Percival, proclaimed James VIII, King of Great Britain, and the 24-year-old Prince Charles Edward Stuart, as Duke of Rossi and Prince Regent. Here you can see a modern proclamation taking place from the Market Cross at Edinburgh, so the heralds would have looked like that in September 1745. These are the arms of the other gentlemen present. Roderick Chalmers, Ross Herald, Alexander Martin, Eiley, William Gray, Dingwall. And of course there was for Dice and Clarkson also present. Apart from Snowden Herald, all the other officers had been appointed by Lord Lyon Erskine of Campbell, who did have Jacobite sympathies. Four days later, the Battle of Preston Pans took place, and Scotland almost belonged to the Jacobite army thereafter apart from the great strongholds of Edinburgh and Stirling castles and the Seagirt castle on Dunbarton Rock. 
But at Preston Pans, of course, the main protagonist uh, commanding the Jacobite army, Lord Murray, commanding the Hanoverian troops, um, seen here on the right, the caricature, General Sir John. On the 25th of September, with the Jacobite army still beside Edinburgh, the barons of the Exchequer ordered that the names of Roderick Chalmers, Alexander Martin and James Fordyce, heralds, William Gray and James Clarkson, pursuants, were to be taken from the list of officers and not to be paid. They were not to be included in any future list of officers until further orders. Within a year, Roderick Chalmers died on the 15th of May 1745, a month after the Battle of Culloden. That battle finished all Jacobite hopes, and the Duke of Cumberland triumphed. He was accompanied at the battle by Lord Lion Alexander Brody of Brody. The day after the battle in Inverness, a new dining club was instituted called the Cumberland Society, which was to meet on the 15th of April each year, the Duke's birthday, and was to consist of the same number of members as the age of the Duke. Among the first 25 members was Lord Lion Brodie. Members could wear a gold medal suspended from a green ribbon with pink edges. And the medal is shown on the screen in this illustration from a book listing members of the Cumberland Society. There is another portrait on the left of Brodie wearing his lion's badge. Some of the remaining officers of arms loyal to the House of Hanover took part in another after the Battle of Clawden when 14 obitted Jacobite army colours were taken to Edinburgh and by command of the 25-year-old Duke of Cumberland, these flags were to be burned with every mark of contempt. On the 4th of June, 1746, the heralds and trumpeters escorted the common executioner who carried the pretender's colours, bearing the royal arms of the United Kingdom, Thirteen chimney sweeps carried the rest of the colours from Edinburgh Castle to the Market Cross on the High Street. And here you can see St Giles Church. You can see behind it the old tall booth and to the right the Market Cross where this act took place. The colours were burned one by one the heralds always proclaiming the names of the commanders to whom the respective colour belonged. Among the clans represented were the Farkersons, the Frasers of Lovett, and the Chisholms. Only one colour belonging to the Stuarts of Appen was saved after the battle and is now on show in the Museum of Scotland, consisting of a blue banner with a yellow saltire. This rather shameful final official duty brought an end to national politics affecting the loyalty of the Scottish officers of arms, an indication of what the 1745 Rising meant to the bulk of the people of Scotland can be summed up by the attitude of Edinburgh Town Council, which was not sympathetic to Prince Charles. Proof of this is a Burgess ticket now in the National Museum collection, dated the 3rd of January 1747, conferring the freedom of the city of Edinburgh on William Augustus, Duke of Cumberland and Captain General of all His Majesty's land forces. Politics affects all our lives, but at least 
We are very fortunate to live in times when loyalty to the sovereign does not endanger the lives of her officers in arms. As a footnote to this paper, and with your indulgence, I would like to conclude by telling you of a project which is to be a unique addition to the cultural heritage of Scotland. The Pitsligo Cast Trust was founded in 1995 and was granted arms in 2005. And there you can see the arms on the screen, blue and white are the national colours of Scotland, three Jacobite roses to represent James VII, James VIII and Charles. The castellated line indicates Pitsligo Castle and the ancient crown symbolises the old royal family of Scotland. Pitsligo Castle is situated very close to Fraserburgh, uh, Canaird's Head, the northeast cold shoulder of Buchan. And when the castle was in its full splendour, it looked something like the model that you see in the bottom right hand corner. The castle was the seat of the fourth Lord Forbes of Pitsligo, a staunch Jacobite who was out in the 1715 and commanded Lord Pitsligo's horse during the 45. The castle is in ruins, but these are being consolidated as a visitor attraction. Close by is the redundant Peat Hill Church containing the finest Laird's Loft in Scotland, which was erected in 1634 by the Forbes family. The church is now owned by the Pitsligo Castle Trust and plans are being drawn up to turn the building into the Peat Hill Heraldic and Jacobite Centre. There you can see the existing church, which is a Victorian uh, building to replace an earlier structure, the Victorian building designed by Marshall Mackenzie and opened in 1897. The interior you can see in the black and white photograph below. The Laird's Loft on the right. The Heraldic and Jacobite Centre will be the very first establishment of its kind in Scotland for the study of heraldry and the Jacobite movement. It's hoped that it might be opened by 2015, the 300th anniversary of the 1715.